Welcome to Monash Matters again. We've got with us uh, Julian Gillespie. We have uh, Dr. Duncan Simon, Julie Sladen. I should uh, explain about Julie, though, to say that Julie is now working on my team. Um, I'm so concerned about these issues that we are going to discuss today in this Royal Commission that um, I asked Julie to come on board and work with me as a team so she could help me answer the really hard questions and give me some technical detail on what I need to know. So to make the main the main point is that we never, ever make a mistake on any information that we're giving out to the public at any stage. Um, so that's why Julie's on board with me. But I'd just like to start off uh, perhaps with you, Julian, and each of you asking why the need for a Royal Commission? Why the need for a Royal Commission? Well, thanks very much for having me on, Russell. Just to, by way of a quick background, I'm a former barrister uh, who came out of <clears throat> retirement when I heard things going awry with uh, COVID-19, particularly the repeated messaging I was hearing in 2021, safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. That didn't add up to me as a former medical school dropout. Um, no drug is, is emphatically safe and effective, uh, particularly a drug that was created in perhaps nine months or less uh, <clears throat> for a global population rollout. Uh, that um, motivated me to challenge the legality of those vaccines and their approval in this country. And indeed we've already brought, uh, what are we up to now? We got to three separate proceedings to the federal court, including the high court, seeking to show that the uh, provisional approval of the COVID-19 vaccines was illegal in Australia. Unfortunately, despite how brilliantly drawn our cases were, the courts shut us down for all the wrong reasons. Uh, apparently uh, siding with the, not, not that we had a, a judgment against us, but technicalities were used to favour the favour the government and uh, not allow the Secretary of Health undergo a proper examination or the approval process to undergo proper judicial examination. So <clears throat> we've got a, a situation of a problem with separation of powers in this country at the moment. We are currently uh, in uh, further proceedings in the federal court where we are suing Pfizer and Moderna directly because their drugs both fulfill the legal definitions in this country for being deemed and properly called GMOs or genetically modified organisms. We've had an admission from the uh, Office of the Gene Technology Regulator in this country, Dr. Raj Bueller, on I believe it was 26 October of last year, where she emphatically stated to a, a Senate Select uh, Committee that these drugs are GMOs, but made up a nonsense um, response as to why they didn't uh, need to obtain GMO licenses before seeking provisional approval. So in the background, a whole lot has gone wrong with the regulatory landscape here, and we've got people covering for everyone else in Canberra and the judiciary assisting <clears throat> to no end that's good for this country. Now, <clears throat> we've also experienced on a, on a population-wide basis, a reversion during 2020, 2021, and 2022 nearly to our penal colony times with extraordinary lockdown measures, social distancing, business closures, mass gatherings were outlawed. Uh, you could only go out and, and exercise. Uh, sometimes that even required a vaccine passport. People couldn't go to work without a vaccine passport. These were all measures which Australian health authorities had agreed in October of 2019 were not to be employed in the event of a pandemic emergency because we had our own pandemic preparedness handbook for influenza that was signed off on by all Australian health authorities and reconfirmed after decades of science confirmed that you don't lock down your nation, you don't ask them to mask, you don't close the schools, you don't enforce social distancing, you do not do contract tracing, you do not close the borders, you do not put people into quarantine camps. Despite decades of science in this, in this area, a, a, an emergency declaration was made prematurely in this country by our own authorities and the governor general. And then all of a sudden, our supposed uh, health leaders started adopting absolutely insane, and that's, it, and that's all they can be called, recommendations out of the WHO coming out of the international health regulations, which saw Australian authorities uh, implement all of those measures which were against the science. And so we found ourselves basically in jail. The Australian population became inmates and we were pursued and hunted by policing authorities if we tried to get on to live a normal life. 
Now, we've started to emerge from the COVID era, as I call it, and we still have millions of Australians who do not know why the social contract was ripped up and burned by a political leaders. They weren't operating as leaders when they didn't follow the science that they were asked to, uh, asked to investigate over the last two decades, but instead followed ridiculous rules out of an unelected uh, international body, the WHO, which seemed to be, have been benefiting those investors in these COVID-19 drugs more than uh, the health and welfare of Australians. Now, there was discussion by Albanese going into the last election that a royal commission into COVID was probably a, an appropriate thing. Well, yes, we say indeed it is. It is the only mechanism that we can put in place <clears throat> to properly, with a forensic comb, go through every single action and decision made by government authorities around this country every step of the way through those years that I mentioned when we were effectively locked down. Now, Where's Albanese gotten to with that? He's backed away, he's backpedaled. Why is he backpedaled? Because a proper Royal Commission ultimately would likely expose the Australian government and the state and territory governments to legal liability because they did everything that was contrary to the science and without any proper assessment with respect to risks and benefits. Albanese towards the end of last year said, don't worry everybody, we'll be okay, we'll just run an inquiry out of my office with people that I put into a position to look at whatever you want me to look at. And you've only got three pages of submissions each that you can submit to me and I will select what my people will look at and come back with a report on. Well, that's a sham, that's, that's avoiding the tradition of a Royal Commission. Now, fortunately, <clears throat> Senator Malcolm Roberts got the numbers up in the Senate last September and a sufficient number of senators provided the critical numbers, which got the vote over. Now we have instructions before a, a committee of the Senate called the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Commi Reference Committee. The task of that committee is now to investigate what are the appropriate terms for a COVID-19 Royal Commission. Now those instructions were given to that committee only late September, uh, early October. <clears throat> And then the return date for the public to place their submissions into that committee for what they believe are appropriate terms of reference is this Friday, 12 January. Now we know most of the country goes on holidays throughout December and most of January. It's school holiday time. What an inconvenient time to put the date for submissions as 12 January. Now that clearly was the first step to try and not have the Australian public being able to be alert to this requirement to meet this date for submissions. And so seeing what they'd already started to do, which was a bit of a stitch up, let's call it what it is, our team, I as the lead author assisted by lawyers, Peter Pham and Katie ashby Copen, started work 60 days ago to find out from Australia's best leading medical and scientific leaders, <clears throat> professors of science, professors of medicine, what are the terms of reference the Australian people need to see for answering all the questions into their grievances over the mistreatment they all suffered and the medical experimentation they were all subjected to? And over that 60-day period, after lots of refinement, we've arrived at a document which is 107 pages long. And hopefully the screen share is working here. Is that, can you see that there? Yes, we can. Okay. Now, I've had a very good relationship with Australian Medical Professional Society, and we have the Vice President, Dr. Duncan Syme, here today. And I approached them when the document was finished, and I said, what do you think? They had a read of the document, and they said, this is extraordinary. This is exactly what all Australians need, what they want, but they need to see it. They need to see it. We will, we will provide you with a web page so we can <coughs> allow the... Australian public to come along and view this record really of history. And in the process, we went and approached all of these other organizations that you can see at the top of the page and more are coming on board. All of their leadership examined the documentation and they said, extraordinary. These are all the questions that everybody's asking. These are all the subject matter that need to be examined by a proper Royal Commission. So these organizations for the first time have come together and they've sent out information to all of their members saying, look at this page, 
look at this page, read the introductory message, but more importantly, go to the terms of reference that have been drawn up <clears throat> for the committee, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, to consider as appropriate terms of reference for a COVID-19 Royal Commission. Now, just so you can see the sort of expertise that went into the formulation of this document, look at the co-authors here, Professor Wendy Hoy, Professor Philip Morris, Emeritus Professor Robert Clancy, Professor Fellow Paul Stevenson, <clears throat> Professor Ramesh Thakur, Professor Ian Brighto, Professor Paul Freises, Professor Gigi Foss, the list goes on and on. Associate Professor Michael Sladen, Associate Professor Peter Parry, Dr. Mart Hobart, who we all know <clears throat> is a hero and suffered at the hands of the draconian, the draconian Afra, because he was trying to save, save his patients from these medical genetic drugs, save them from being part of the experiment. Dr. Paul Oosterhaus, <clears throat> the list goes on. But then we get the references, 52 references here into every nook and cranny of everything that was imposed upon Australians and everything that was withheld from Australians. There were always valid alternate medical treatments long known to be safe and effective. Ivermectin being one of them, been around <clears throat> for decades now. It has been prescribed billions and billions of times. Those who, who, who discovered Ivermectin received the Nobel Prize. But in this country, all of a sudden, it was made illegal for a health practitioner to exercise their professional judgment to instead offer that treatment which is safe and benign to their patients instead of these genetic drugs. These questions as to why these sorts of decisions were made and why the doctor-patient relationship <clears throat> was trampled upon and we had government come in between the doctor and the patient and impose its ideas on that most sacred of relationship was absolutely disgusting and we say it was illegal and part of what this Royal Commission needs to examine. Now, to be clear, <clears throat> Mr. Albanese is scared. He's scared as hell of this Royal Commission because it will show the complicity of his own Labor Party and that of the previous Liberal Party in doing all the wrong things, in following all the, no the non-science. They were just taking orders from the WHO. We well, we won't go into the, the outcomes of the Royal Commission. Thank you. Um, right. I think we'll just go straight to Julie now and say, Julie, just a bit of a background on yourself um, and then doctor to you. Uh, th thanks, Russell. Um, yeah, I'm Dr Julie Sladden, for those who don't know me. Um, I was actually personally affected uh, by the mandates back in 2021, but prior to that, you know, looking at Australia's response to the pandemic, I was extremely concerned at some of the um, public health messaging and measures that were being taken because it was in direct contravention to the Australia's um, pandemic plans for influenza and they'd been updated as recently as August 2019 as Julian has suggested but um, it, things took a turn for the worse when I was personally affected by the mandates and I refused to be uh, injected um, with, with a, what I saw was an experimental vaccine. Um, I was not at risk of, of serious um, harm from from the disease, from what I could tell, based on um, the evidence that was coming out from overseas and uh, the the work of the people who'd actually been looking at the the case uh, fatality rates, like Jenna Notis and uh, Co, and the, all the public health um, experts overseas. So um, I closed my practice, and ever since then, I've essentially been um, writing, advocating, and and working to bring about the truth. Um, about what's really been going on because we are seeing some alarming um, changes on the on the front of healthcare in this country, especially as you said, Julian, with regards to um, the interface between doctors and their patients. And there's been an incredible overreach uh, by the government that I've never quite seen before, but most seriously, the uh, breach of informed consent, um, which is really what has um, uh, been my, my bugbear in that, you know, when the country was mandated, essentially nobody could give informed consent. And, and really, I, I, I think the uh, country as a whole, you know, in response 
you know, by suffering through the the various measures of lockdowns and masking and school closures and businesses and 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 the mandates. It's just been decimated. And you know, we was I was talking to someone the other day, and they basically said that the the country has a, a basically post-traumatic <laughs> stress disorder. And I thought that's a pretty accurate description. So a Royal Commission was always warranted. Um, and we ha there hasn't been one forthcoming. Interestingly, the Senate um, Select Committee in uh, April 20, it was formed in 2020, but reported its final report in April 2022. And I found the report in the Parliamentary Library and um, it was chaired by Katie Gallagher. And recommendation 17 was that Australia should have a Royal Commission because errors had been made. Um, and people will argue about what those errors were, but that's what a Royal Commission is for. Um, so I just uh, am extremely heartened to see how all these organisations, last count there were there were 14, but I know there are more coming on board who have risen up to this challenge of um, collaborating on this, on this document and spearheaded by the cracking legal team um, to actually document all of the questions that need to be answered. And I'm sure there'll be many more that, that come out of this, but we have four days left essentially until the 12th or to the end of this week to get as many uh, public signatories on board as well. This is Australians, um, their opportunity to get on board and, and sign this document, um, be co-signatories so that we can send a very clear message um, about what Australians want in the terms of a Royal Commission and getting to those uh, answers of the unanswered questions. Dr Duncan Syme, this is a great book that your organisation AMPS, AMPS is the Australian Medical Professional Society. You're all doctors and specialists, all of you, yet you're being ignored. As far as I'm concerned, you're being ignored. I'm, as much as I'm a politician, I'm a member of the public and I see what the public sees, and that's practically nothing compared to what you and Julie and um, Julian and Julia are putting together. So today, I'm so grateful to have you here, Duncan, as with the three of you, but um, I'll leave it over to you, Duncan. How'd you get here? Well, it's uh, it's been a long journey for all of us these last uh, three and a half to four years. Uh, I'm a general practitioner of 34 years experience and like Julie, I was uh, forced to resign my position at Monash Health back at the uh, in October 2021 because I refused to be injected by these uh, uh, med medical uh, or therapeutic products, which they call vaccines, but in fact, uh, uh, basically gene therapies or yeah, uh, a product of gene therapies. Uh, and I've subsequently been uh, suspended by APRA because I was standing up for my patient's right to bodily autonomy. Uh, and I've uh, in the process accused uh, uh, ARPA and the medical board that they, by their position statement in March uh, 9th, 2021, they were causing doctors to behave in an unethical fashion by coercing them into uh, uh, following their code of conduct through their threats of regulatory action against doctors who uh, went against the government narrative. Um, but essentially, I, I was deeply concerned at the, the start of the pandemic because of the uh, what I saw as quite bizarre public health uh, dictates, which I thought were causing great harm to society and uh, the health of the population. And I couldn't understand why those decisions were being made. They reminded me of decisions made in the uh, medieval times in the, in, when the plague was round. Anyway, uh, subsequent to that, uh, I've uh, joined AMPS and uh, have uh, subsequently continued to to speak out against what I saw as um, terrible public health policy decisions. I believe the uh, the Great Barrington Declaration showed us the way back in uh, you know early in in 2020, uh, signed by three of the leading infectious disease epidemiologists, uh, who basically said focused protection was the was the way to go. Um, which is in, 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 I suppose, layman's terms is uh, common sense. Uh, and that meant following the, the evidence-based science that was put into the, um, uh, the uh, pandemic preparedness um, uh, for influenza document that was uh, um, 
uh, you know, re-signed or updated in August uh, of 2019 by the Australian uh, you know, uh, government. Uh, and the uh, incredible departure from that in the space of a few short months to following um, uh, who advice uh, in early 20, um, early uh, 2020 um, uh, has resulted, I believe, in you know great harms to the Australian uh, Australian public, you know, both physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, and economically. Um, and uh, so, I said uh, with AMPS, I'm trying to make as many people aware of the concerns we have and uh, bring back proper medical debate and scientific debate into this country, um, which has been abandoned uh, in this this time of COVID. Um, I'd thoroughly concur with all uh, the message that uh, Julian and Julie have said, with all their, their concerns. This document that uh, is being hosted by AMPS is uh, an amazingly comprehensive and a deep document, and it's it's got to be considered as a people's document. This is what the yeah all those millions of people who went to the streets at various stages in 20, uh, 2020 and twenty twenty one um, are wanting answers for the incredible imposition uh, that uh, our government and public health bureaucrats uh, put upon them. Yeah, yeah why do you think? Men- why do any of you think that that was the case? So why did we go down that track? I mean, even people like myself that felt powerless under the mandates and the instructions, especially when um, you you would all know that people like myself cannot do anything without a substantial amount of public support. Everything Absolutely. I've done in my past history as a politician has been to say that look. I know, to go to my party or the parliament to say, I know I have public support in this position. Now, it's taken a long time, Julian, I think you'll concur, to get to a point where we have some public support. People, as Julie mentioned earlier, people are still in shock. We still have a nationwide situation of post-traumatic stress disorder. Everyone was affected in multiple ways, um, and what's what, where they've really become speechless is that there was the total rip-up and destruction of the social contract. Now, um, I grew up where every person in Canberra was called a public servant, servant of the people, which therefore makes the Australian public who pay their checks the masters of those public servants. We experienced an era where the servants locked down their masters and didn't provide sufficient explanation except fear, 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 and fear mongering. And that was assisted with dodgy and unreliable statistics and so-called science coming out of bodies like the WHO and officials in the US who were telling us that 10, 20, 30% of the population was going to die. Now, it was known in early 2020 that the uh, case for infection fatality rate for SARS-CoV-2 was no better than a severe influenza season. And that came from uh, research conducted by Professor John Ioannidis in pushback to the absolutely absurd claims that were being made by officials in the WHO, who when presented with Professor Ioannidis' epidemiological studies, started to pull back their statements because they were untrue. Now, for some reason, Australian authorities here ignored the available science, like that by the incredibly world famous Professor John Ioannidis saying, what are you talking about? This is just a severe influenza season. We just have to protect our most elderly and our most frail. The rest of society can just get on with business as usual. That was the fundamental statement behind the great Barrington Declaration, signed again by hundreds of experts in in the public health arena, and it was all ignored because there was just a priority thrown down to the politicians in this country 
to follow the absurd international health regulation recommendations to lock down and mandate the entire country. And those same recommendations included public messaging, nudging messaging, all about the fear messaging, the fear mongering, to get people to become, quote, compliant, to obey every single order that was coming out of ultimately Canberra, and but also the state governments. Canberra dangled billions of dollars in front of every single state and territory government and says, look, where's the federal government? Do not have power over health in this country. All you states do. But if you implement these recommendations coming out of the international health regulations, regulations, that is the WHO, we will give you billions of dollars and disregard anything else, any other evidence that's presented to you. So all the state governments were incentivized to take the money at all costs, take the money. So money was the motivator for, for instance, Premier Gladys Berejiklian stepping up to the microphone and cameras twice a day, sometimes three times a day to say, you've got to get it to save grandma and it's safe and effective. What the hell does she know about safe and effective as a politician, non-medical practitioner? Mm. Duncan, what were your, you went through that time. What were your patients saying to you? What were your other doctors around you in your in your practice saying to you? How were you able to stand up against them? What what did you see that need? What did you see where you responded in such a dramatic way? And it is dramatic to throw in your job, by the way. Hmm. Well, uh, there was a, a great deal of uh, obviously concern by. Uh, patients and, and public, but they were being kept, yeah, they said they were just hearing one one side of the story through the the mainstream media, um, though there were quite a number who were pretty concerned about the uh, uh, the the measures that were being taken um, and were, were, were deeply concerned about the intrusiveness of, of government uh, impacting on their lives. Um, the medical profession was probably, uh, and that was probably pretty understandable. The the medical profession was, uh, yeah, from my discussions with uh, many of my colleagues at uh, you know the hospital complex that I was at was uh, deeply disturbing because when I tried to raise these issues with them, they um, really didn't want to engage, and I'm not entirely sure why that was. You know, the normal uh, the, the normal expectation would be to have a uh, yeah intense discussion about this uh, yeah I suppose new phenomenon and uh, have different people's opinions about it and what do you think of this and what do you think of that they really the vast majority didn't want to engage there was huge pressure from uh, the medical management within the hospital and obviously from you know the the, the governments um, about conformity. Uh, and uh, there was uh, threats that uh, you would be um, referred to APRA if you uh, you went against the party line. Uh, mm. And I'm assuming that that shut down the vast majority of doctors, that they didn't want to think about it because they were potentially putting their, their jobs at risk. Right. What's the next step? Uh, perhaps, Julie, you might. What, what's our next step from here? We're nearly out of time. So what's our next step with the Royal Commission? Well, I, I mean, I think a, a, an excellent document has been uh, created here for Australians to show and their support for and to get behind. So our most immediate step this week is for as many people to look at those terms of reference, see if they resonate and get on board and, and sign the document um, if you are supporting these terms of reference as they've been created by the multiple collaborators and organisations to send that strong message to the government that a Royal Commission is what the people of Australia want. I mean, years of pain, thousands, uh, um, millions of lives impacted um, we deserve answers, and that's our most immediate step next. And I just want to reassure people that, you know, we're four years down the track, and although people are battle-weary, um, those who have been continuing to dig up the evidence, to ask the questions and to essentially fight the fight are not going anywhere. Um, we haven't forgotten the people um, 
and we will continue to do the steps and take the steps necessary to make sure that we get the answers that Australians deserve. To my two doctors sitting there, and you might like to, to comment, Gillian, if these vaccines are safe and effective, how come there was a report in the paper the other day that 350 people who were vaccinated were hospitalised with COVID? Well, I'll jump in because involved in all the legal cases we have been, we as lawyers have come to know the science pretty clearly on this because we have been consulting with Dr. Duncan Simon and Dr. Julie Sladen over the last years, recent years. Uh, first of all, they're not really vaccines at all, Russell. And secondly, they don't work. They do not stop transmission. <clears throat> they do not stop infection. That was known in 2021 by our health authorities, yet they continued to push them. These things were created with respect to the Wuhan strain, which was only in circulation in early 2020. And so by the time you're pushing this onto the Australian population, mid-2021 and beyond, we're already six, seven or eight, nine, ten different versions of the, of the virus away from what the drug was meant to impact upon. So there was no way that when you got to Omicron, for instance, these so-called vaccines were going to have any effect. Because Julian, I know what you're talking about, but the public don't. <laughs> I'll put it over to Duncan and Julie then. <laughs> Go for no, it, the Duncan. point that I'm making is that, that um, I absolutely respect what you've just said. Hmm. And that comes out of your experience um, within the court cases that you've you've had and your own learning, hmm. your own research. But I, I'm with the Australian public every day. I've just been at Phillip Island over the last 10 days. And can I tell you, there is no interest in this issue whatsoever. Nothing. Well, that's because we must give congratulations and props to the Australian uh, government and its health authorities for conducting the most successful misinformation campaign against Australian citizens when they continue to come out and advertise these things. Go and get your latest booster to protect against COVID. That's an out and out lie. And this is why we've been in the courts to try and get one of the reasons why we've been in the courts to try and get the Australian government to stop misinforming the Australian people about these things having any effective benefit against so-called COVID, which is only just like the flu. Let's get that very clear. COVID. No, I did hear. I did hear the other day, Julian, that um, there there are some slight benefits with these vaccine, with these so-called vaccines, with these injections, but it might only be for a couple of weeks. It might only be for a couple of weeks. But here's the other thing: does does the Australian public know? when they took the Pfizer and Moderna shots, that they were being asked to receive a GMO or genetically modified organism. No, but they don't understand that. It, forgive me, but I don't think much of the general population understands that either anyway. That's so, right. Once again, the Australian government kept that information from the Australian public. So therefore, how could the Australian public provide full informed consent when they were not informed? Oh, by the way, this is a new gene therapy drug, contains GMO ingredients, it could alter your DNA. We've been having this argument with the former Secretary of Health of this country, Brendan Murphy, for nearly two years. Why do you not present the, <clears throat> the scientific evidence to show that this is a gene therapy and got an admission from the Australian Authority for Genetically Modified Organisms, the gene technology regulator, that these are GMOs? But yeah. she didn't. I think, I think that's another whole argument. Is that going to be addressed in the Royal Commission, everybody? <laughs> Absolutely. We're that, currently uh, in the middle of is... proceeding and it's in the, the terms of reference. Yes. Look, Russell, Duncan. just um, um, just on that point um, about, you know, the, the general public, um, often you, you do find, I had a conversation myself the other day with um, a friend down at the beach and it was a really interesting and, and grounding conversation for me because it just reminds me that a lot of people don't fully understand um how far we departed from what is considered to be 
um, good a good response in the uh, in a pandemic or what's considered to be um, good uh, for informed consent obtaining informed consent and so unfortunately I've seen a lot of people realize that there's a problem through some kind of tragic event where a loved one has um, been affected adversely by um, one of the injections or um, people around them have been dying suddenly and they've started to ask questions and, and and that breaks my heart as well that it that it's taking a tragedy for them to to start asking questions themselves um yeah so that was just just it is really important that we that we consider that that not everybody understands that some of this language is highly technical um the government did a very good job in their in their messaging and so a lot of um the things that we talk about every day are, aren't fully understood and um, I think my, my message to people would be, you know, if you have questions about anything that um, happened in the pandemic or the government's response or that didn't simply add up, you know, have a look at the uh, terms of reference document because you'll probably find that's one of the questions that we're asking too. Well, I'll be signing the document. Thank you all for your time today. Um, I'd like to have a little bit of discussion before you leave, but um, I'm just going to do a wind up and thank you. So to you, Julian, to Julian, to Duncan, thank you so much for today. We've got to do this again. Perhaps I might do it with each of you as individuals so you all get some more time. So thanks for today. Thank you, Russell. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Russell.